of Time Spoilers podcast. Speaking of knives, shall we cut these pink ribbons? <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's a nice little it. segue there. Ribbon. Let's go. <laughs> I'm getting better at them. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was good. That was good. So, yeah, we're here today with our, at this point, um, regular guest, Morgan from Podcast of the Dragon, which if you haven't checked out, what are you doing? And we are getting into pink ribbons, which is an awful lot of mat and a little bit of two on. Scotch of two on. Yeah. Just a tiny, uber significant moment. <laughs> but uh, yes, we are very, very glad to have Morgan here with us today to talk about all kinds of women being weird to Matt. <laughs> <laughs> all kinds of weird. I mean, so can we just get out of the way and be like, the pink ribbons are about bondage, right? Right? Mm. Can we just yeah, state that up some, front? Just some weird, like, costuming bondage. Mm-hmm. Backstory, <laughs> something. Well, because remember, in the last chapter, Matt said he'd won some concessions from Thailand, but now those had run out, and she was going to get back mm-hmm. at him. And it and it sounds like the pink ribbons are something he did to her first in yeah. that moment of concessions, and now she is taking her quote unquote revenge by doing the same thing to him. Yeah, there, there's a. She says, "Do you recall mm-hmm. the pink ribbons?" This like he used pink ribbons in some fashion and we'll never know what that was, but it causes him a lot of blocking things out sort of mental processes. So, yeah, it's definitely really kinky, whatever it is. All right. Chapter 17, pink ribbons. And our symbol is the dice for Matt and his luck. Cold winds gusted through the Malhara, lifting Matt's cloak and threatening to freeze the mud, caking his clothing, as he and Noel hurried out of the alley. The sun sat on the rooftops, half hidden, and the shadows stretched long, with one hand for his staff and the other gripping the broken cord of the fox head, stuffed into a coat pocket where he could snatch it out if need be. He had to let his cloak go where it would. He ached from head to foot, the dice rattling, warning inside his skull, and he hardly noticed either thing. He was too busy trying to watch every direction at once, and wondering just how small a hole that thing could get through. He found himself uneasily eyeing cracks between the square's paving stones, though it hardly seemed like the thing would come at him in the open. A hum carried from the surrounding streets, but here only a slat ribbed dog moved, running past the fountain statue of long dead Queen Nareen. Some said her uplifted hand pointed to the ocean's bounty that had, ins- that had enriched Ebudar, and some that it pointed in warning of dangers. Others said her successor had wanted to draw attention to the fact that only one of the statue's breasts was uncovered, proclaiming that Narlene had only been of middling honesty. <laughs> I don't know why I find the whole one breast uncovered for only middling honesty so funny, but it is. No, no, tits out for the truth in Ibudar. Only one. <laughs> yeah, if you cover up your tits, you're hiding something. So the fact that she's only yeah. halfway naked is like deceitful. That feels a little um, like the Aes Sedai ceremony where they have to, you know, big time. B- bear their breasts to prove the I truth. I am a woman. I am a woman. And this woman's hiding. She could be a half woman. You never know. <laughs> With only one boob. Yeah. Clearly, we are concerned enough that this was a literal half man, half woman, straight down the middle chimera <laughs> person. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's that's what we need to depict. Well, it's like that Halloween costume with Halloween coming up where they do the half and like, you know, the, the bombshell and the other half is like in a suit. Well, that's just hot. <laughs> um, <clears throat> no. So the only thing about this statue is this is where he runs into Bale Domon in mm-hmm. the future. Uh, when he meets what? up with Bail Domon. Yeah, a little bit later, he's going to be, after we get the POV um, from Egyanan's point of view, where they realize that the Seekers are on to them, and Domon's like, I ran into Matt Cawthon downstairs. He's got Jolene on his lap, because he's going to... Yes. Domon accosts him in the square and is like, hey, let's have a drink right now. Um, and so, you know, you get a little bit of recap about the city, you get about the Thailand queen of Mitsubar and how she's rules uh, all of Altara, but really only as much as within a few, day, few days ride. 
Um, and then a little bit about Suroth being in the city, who actually is in charge of the Shalanchan, who are quite a bit more powerful than the person who, you know, rules the city. Yeah, it it's... Um, the Shalanchan have made a lot of changes. There are no longer beggars. They have all been taken up into work camps because we're going full Victorian London <laughs> on this. And also, yeah, they are in control. And there's no real pretense that Thailand's in There's the various barest, barest, barest hint that Thailand's in control of anything. It's very obvious that the Sean Chan have completely redefined how the city works. So I have a question for you. Have you heard about the changes coming to Portland's homeless oh God. Uh, policy? Yep. Vaguely. Okay. So just curious if you had any opinions on that, because it looks like what they're announcing is a, they're going to open a few areas for homeless people to go and then make it illegal to camp on the streets. Mm-hmm. And it gotcha. just, you know, on one level, I'm like, okay, maybe localizing the problem could be helpful. And then you can get those people more help. But then I looked at the numbers and it's something like, I don't know, 30,000 people are living on the streets and they've got room for like 500. Ooh. Yeah, no, it's, it's horrific because it's basically like they're making those people as winter is coming on illegal to live in Portland. And it's sort of like, Clumping them all together is dangerous because there's a certain lawlessness to everybody being in one place, and a lot of times safety is a huge issue, and there are so many homeless people, and it's like if you really want to help the problem, then make rent stop being so fucking expensive because it's just getting more expensive, and they approved... uh them being able to jack it up like 14.7% next year um, because of inflation. And so it's just kind of like they're going to get more homeless people because, and it's just, and plus the timeline to be able, they're like, oh, well, in like what, 18 months or two years or something, they're going to have these camps ready, but they're going to make it illegal to camp on the streets now. Mm -hmm. What? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jesus, that's... That's some black agit Lord of Chaos style bullshit. Well, I think they're doing it because they don't want the Republicans to get control. And basically everybody's like, we're so tired of the homeless problem and the lawlessness that we're getting ready to vote Republican. And so, oh yeah. Oh my God. I see the political calculus mm -hmm. and I hate yeah, it. It's, mm -hmm. I hate it. Um, yeah. I'm like, why don't you just make it so that rent is cheaper? Hmm. Let's actually help people. Oh, but my God-given right to extract all the wealth from everyone just one rogue below me. Mm -hmm. So, anyway. Yeah, I mean, that's a whole different... I guess we can really get in discussion about the housing policies and zoning laws in Portland. But that is definitely not what this podcast is I don't know if we have about. that kind of time. <laughs> like, I don't need that level of anger in my um, life right now. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, my point is the Sean Chan are fairly ruthless about it. And it is... Um, a way of dealing with the homeless population, not one that's particularly humane or helpful or really treating the symptoms of uh, homelessness, you know. Um, and so uh, Portland's not doing a lot better, but the, Sh the Shanshan wouldn't allow rent gouging. So, right. <laughs> no, the Shanshan would very firmly discourage mm -hmm. rent gouging with like the Imperial Guard yeah. if necessary. <laughs> But, I mean, they are running into a similar problem with housing, right? They have the return showing up. They literally have more people flooding into the city than the the native infrastructure can hope to even begin to deal with, right? And they're doing it in a military-style support and conquer way, but that's the only way they're able to, to push this many people into a city that's otherwise would have been completely overwhelmed. Actually, that yeah, that's a perfect point, because the reason that Noel is where he is to help Matt is because he's been literally pushed out into the street because an officer kicked a merchant out of his bed, and so Noel got kicked out of his bed. And he's like, I'm going to try to sleep in this alley. It's not the first. It's like, I'm never for fascism and never for authoritarianism. It always seems like that you know, there are no simple solutions to sticky problems. Uh, there's, I mean, I, th I think I see what, what you and RJ were driving at, which is like, but under fascism, the trains run on time. Mm -hmm. Right, but right. The more I listen to podcasts of people talking about fascism history, 
the more that assumption is being challenged, and that's actually a bit of a myth, fallacy, comfort blanket, maybe. And I don't think RJ points to that at all. I think RJ is like, no, the Sean Chan or the fascists or the trans run on time. And like, I don't know that that's true in real life. Well, I also think if you've ever worked for a company run by unrealistic and unreasonable assholes, you will cut corners. Uh, none of us have ever done <laughs> that. No. Cut, you know, yeah, with unreasonable goals or whatever, you will cut corners or tell them whatever they want to hear so they'll get off your ass, you know, to be like, oh yeah, these goals are totally being met, or you'll skip on safety, or you'll, you know, you'll ignore whatever huge issues that are going to come back and bite you in the ass in the end in order to tell the assholes in charge who will be assholes and breathe down your neck otherwise that whatever is getting done is getting done. So, you know, I don't think anything really runs super smoothly under fascism. They just tell the fascists that it is so they won't be extra fascisty. Speaking of Russia, Putin and oh. Ukraine, um, like, I mean, that, which is basically they went in there thinking they had the second best army in the world and they were going to dominate. And it turns out that the fascism and, and top down authoritarianism of Russia has caused all sorts of supply chain problems because they were lied to in exactly that way, that, that because they were unreasonable requests. People were saying, yeah, totally, we got that. That's what we're doing. And they weren't doing it. <laughs> yeah, no, something else I have learned in my my study, of my armchair study of podcast history is um, fascists are messy bitches. <laughs> yeah. Like, they're just messy bitches. Like, the interpersonal bullshit that leads to these lies and these tears of people all lying up the chain. Like, it comes down to really messy personal politics. It's just like... What? You got your entire war effort got brought down because no one wanted to tell this guy no? Really? Like, because he just simply wouldn't shut up because he was hopped up on coke? Like, that's it? Uh, okay. It's amazing what a hostile work environment will do. I guess. Reminds me a little bit of Cotswain, actually, in that sort of hostile work environment. I think that's one of the reasons why people don't like her is this idea that, like, she's going to make you feel stupid for making mm -hmm. mistakes. Catswin's a bully, oh, yeah. and bad yeah. bosses are often bullies. Like, the, yes, she is a toxic boss, for sure. Oh, but she's nice to the lowest person who brings in the coffee and changes the printer machine. Oh, good for yeah, her. Yeah, great. Lovely. She's still a bully. And then you've got Anath, also a bully. Well, she's a sadist. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> subtle subspecies. <laughs> But to return to the books, we, we can talk about the fact that Sirlevan Surratt literally shows up in this one chapter and that's it. That's a, a gate guard character that Matt makes a snide comment about and there is nothing else to him mm -hmm. at all. This is the only time we see him. He gets a name. I consider him a level two character as I rate his characters on a level of one to ten where Rand is ten and Matt Perrin and Egwene are nine. To, you know, whatever named character that you don't have any interaction with is a one, this dude's a two. So. Oh, so if they, they get on the scale, they have to be named. Yeah, you have to be named and someone has to think about them to be, to be on the scale mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as far as a Jordan character. And this is one where Matt's like, oh, he's got a good eye for horse flesh. And then he gives him bad news. And he's like, well, maybe not that good. <laughs> Ready with a quip. This guy's yeah. an asshole. It's right. hilarious how quickly he turns on people well, yeah. in his head. Because everybody's got an opinion about the fact that Matt's gotten dirty. And the queen won't like the fact that he's gotten dirty again, operating under the assumption that he's been getting into fights. And it's just sort of like, and Matt has this low level but constant anxiety about Tylen being mad because she's keeping him against his will. He's basically being kept as a sex slave and and he's determined to keep her goodwill because he, you know, wants his life to be as not unpleasant as possible and it's sort of like, you know, you yeah, want to keep the person who's keeping you captive, you know, in as good a mood as possible. And so everybody's just kind of like, oh, she's going to be upset about that, and it like, keeps hitting that anxiety button, and then, of course, the dice have started rolling in his head, and those always make him anxious as it is. Right. I love that he goes to the um, Abu Dhar guards because they're more flexible than the Sean Chan, and in my head, I translated that to bribable. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, yes! <laughs> that was basically... Yeah, they've taken, they've taken some money off of him. 
Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Little Jen. No, they do limbo better. That's why, because they're more flexible. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, Ferris. They got those baggy breeches. They provide better freedom of movement. So he brings in Noel and basically says, you know, this is my dude. He saved my life. And they, so they're like, I don't know. You both look like pretty filthy beggars. But then again, he does look less filthy than Matt. So go on in. <laughs> I love that. He's like, well, I know you and you look worse off than this guy. So by that measure, this guy must be OK. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Matt has enough uh, social capital to be able to be like, this is my friend. I need him to come hang out with my men. And he also has the resources sort of allotted to him for eight men that are dead at this point. So it's like there's plenty of space for him to bring a person in, which is a sad reason to have resources. But yay for Noel. Yeah, it's like, take your pick, Noel. So there's like an interesting little cultural thing where Sir Levin mentions because the, there's a courier that comes up. And they wait for her to go through. And Sir Levin's like, the, the Shanchen always asks permission of the Ebudari guards and not the Shanchen guards. And it's just like a little notice that, you know, the Shanchen do have rules as far as lands that they conquer and letting them keep culture to a certain extent and showing respect to the people who are in charge and acknowledging that, you know, technically... You know, you are the ones who have the right to determine whether or not you should go in, even if, you know, you said no, then it would be a problem, which I guess is a way of keeping goodwill to a certain extent. They know that, you know, bad morale is problematic since it's always mentioned you deal with endless rebellions in Shanshan, which if you look at the map in the, the Big White Book of Bad Art, it's an enormous continent. It's, if you look at the new map, it's even bigger. It's I much bigger. I haven't seen the new map. Oh, hold on. Oh, it's so much bigger. So imagine, I'll just verbally describe it while Seth gets it for you. It's like if there was a boot, but the foot had been cut off, and now the foot's been added back on. It's really dramatic. Oh, wow. Wow. It's like Ran lands the size of one little part of it. <laughs> I know, right? Most of the Shanchan continent is in the Southern Hemisphere. Which is why they had a sex igloo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Huh? Basically. But yeah, no, that gives you an idea of just how big this chunk of the boot. I mean, this, just the tip of the boot is basically all the continent of, of the Westlands. And with all of the channels and stuff, it makes sense why their navy is so strong. And... Also, though, broken up like that makes sense why it's easy for people to have, like, constant rebellions, because that's a lot of defensible land. So, you know, what a pain in the ass. No wonder they want to come back. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, we need a smaller homeland. <laughs> and I'm not sure where the capital of Shanchan is. Shandar? It is called Shandar. I have no idea where on the continent it is. Right, right. I'm assuming roughly in the middle, but that leaves a lot of area. <laughs> I mean, it could be, or it could be just on the tip of something, right? Like, I mean, Rome wasn't exactly in the middle of, of the Mediterranean. No. I would assume it was a port, but it might just be on a big river. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm important. assuming it's temperate. It's probably not any, either of the climate extremes that the continent offers. But again, that's like between 45 north and south. That's not specific. There's a couple of fatty rivers <laughs> right on the equator. It might be around there. Some inland seas and stuff, maybe that have some really good trade, like the Mediterranean. I mean, the sea cuts the entire continent in half, as far as I can tell, right? Like, those bays go all the way through. It seems like, but that seems difficult to imagine. Right, like, following this goes all the way down through those, and cuts that off. Those are know? so big. I mean, are they even bays? They're like the size of... It, it, it's weird, because it, it, we don't have any th really thing equivalent to that. Like the Mediterranean, maybe the Dead Sea, almost? Yeah, no, that's much more like it's a sea when you're standing there looking at it. But it's, yeah, the, the basin size is tiny compared to a proper ocean. Right. And so that's why I imagine something, you know, maybe Shandar is on one of those Mediterranean-like bays. Because it would be really easy to have a, a very prosperous city with lots of trade inside the continent, but still have access to that water and that seawater. I'm sure it's very biologically productive for their empire of soldiers that they keep throwing away. 
Yeah, for real. And yeah, and it also sounds like when you hear like different tribes and stuff that there are people who are more Sean Chenny and less Sean Chenny, and it's not a universal empire where everybody is totally devoted to the Empress May She Live Forever and this kind of united front of people that they've brought is maybe just the loyalist of Shanshan and that they've left left behind the more disenchanted folks. Or they could be sending some of the more rebellious folks over to the new continent to settle it, you know, give them a chance to find new places and settle new things and establish, you know, a lot of, a lot of people came to America to get away from the oppressive government. That's true. Back home. Or were so. actively sent away from England for being too right. disruptive to right. it. Right. Also, see Australia as an example right. of that. But I mean, it definitely started with the U.S. and then the U.S. was like, "How about fuck you?" And they're like, "Ah, we need a new continent to dump our prisoners on." <laughs> it was a whole thing. But yeah. If I'm counting correctly, Matt has brought originally with him thirteen red arms because he's got eight dead and five with him. That sounds right. And yeah. if I do that math, that's 13. So, yeah, just I was like, of course, here's another instance of 13 in the books somewhere. Well, I think it's considered 12 red arms and a scout. I don't think Vannon counts as a red arm, but 13 members of the band. Right, right. OK, fair enough. So, yeah, he's got he originally I was like, how many beds does he have originally? It's 13, eight of which are dead. Two of the five of which will will be killed by the golem, at least. Yep. So yeah, where, where we were at before we tangented off on that was Morgan pointing out this interaction between uh, the Shan Chan courier and the palace guards, because that's I think that's a really important conversation to return to because I, Noel inserts himself into a lot of this, <laughs> and I can't tell if he's genuinely learning anything or if he's just playing dumb. I don't know. That's a question I have a lot, especially because I feel like RJ made it a point to make Noel seem super sketchy for as long as he possibly could, which is useful. I mean, when you have a character kind of pop up like that, you want somebody, especially if they're going to come in close to your characters, to be suspicious. Um, Because, I mean, yeah, you want to suspect all kinds of people and assume that they're going to be potentially dangerous. But it's also just useful for um, kind of a little bit of like non-contrived exposition to have him ask a question like that so that you can bring up the listeners and things like that and have it not be quite so much just like Matt's thinking about the listeners in his head just as he explains everything else to us in recap. So, a pretty good way to do that. And it says that Noel sounds irritated with himself, you know, when uh, uh, Matt is explaining to him. And, you know, we know that he's his head isn't quite right, that he has been compelled by Grendel, and that he struggles to remember things. Um, he's kind of gotten free of her because the city fell to the Shanchen, so she presumably doesn't know where he is. But that doesn't mean, like, his head isn't still kind of fucked. And he's struggling to remember stuff. Yeah, because at first it feels to me like sort of a Tom move to be like, oh, let me ask a really obvious question of the guards and, like, find some information out. But then, yeah, you're right. He is irritated later on. And it does make sense that he wouldn't have picked up on the whole listeners thing from being, like, a street-level person. Like, that's the kind of thing you only find out about if you hang out with, like, royals and stuff, which is why Matt is actually telling him something new. Yeah, I guess I guess that makes that makes more sense. But yeah, it's just it's a very interesting interaction both to learn about Noel and is he sketchy, is he not, and also like how the Sean Chan exercise power while maintaining the illusion that they are not. Yeah, because I feel like if you're going to be an invading force, showing respect to the, to the people that you've invaded and making it seem like they have at least some control over your life, it's like letting your children make decisions, you know, like laying out when you're when your kids like eight years old laying out a couple of outfits for them to pick from or something so they feel like they have power over their life it makes them more amenable to being told what to do and so i feel like that's a lot of what's going on here as far as letting the altarans feel like they have more control over their city than makes sense to them considering they're a conquered land well and sean chan have a history of going in and changing as little as possible in these conquered lands, right? They're they're not their goals are not necessarily to 
assimilate the culture of the culture of the conquered lands into the Shan Chan culture. But it's again, the Roman Empire is sort of more of the way I think of it, where they really did say, OK, how do we take your traditions and integrate them into our uh, system, which is why every Christian holiday is on pagan uh, dates. <laughs> but there's a bunch of other evidence and things like that. Yeah, I mean, it's all throughout the Roman history, even before Christianity comes into the picture. Like, it's the easiest way to co-opt people is to be like, pay us taxes and maybe put up a temple or some shit. Like, I don't know. You could. <laughs> it's easier. Life goes on if you fuck off and leave people alone. So if you change as little as possible and it doesn't affect them, mostly, or you put in some changes that are kind of to the good for a lot of people, then the general run of people will look the other way at the stuff that isn't so great. And if their day-to-day -day life is either no worse than it was before or potentially kind of better, then they will kind of get used to it and not worry about it so much. And that just kind of seems to be what's going on here. It was one of the reasons why the Tanchikans fell in so easily and they were able to not just get a whole army, which they needed. They needed soldiers and conscripts to be able to actually be an effective fighting force on this side of the ocean, but soldiers that were good enough that they considered them loyal was because they were complete anarchy, and then they actually got, you know, order and food and stability and good leadership. As opposed to the other option, which is just wiping out everybody in the area you invade, which is also maybe less profitable, but certainly very effective and much simpler for the conquering people. Yeah, depends. I think on a small scale, but you gotta, you have to have people to deal with logistics. So I'm, I, again, I'm thinking more of like native American population. Oh and yeah. England. Yeah. Yeah. Where it's just like, yeah, no, we, we just don't want to deal with them. We're just going to take everything. And if they protest, we kill them. But it also requires in significantly superior weaponry. Like, a huge part of, like, our success in wiping out Native Americans was because we had trains and guns, so we could hunt the buffalo way fucking faster, yeah. right? Like Also, also the diseases, germs. Well, yeah. I mean, guns, germs, and steel. Yeah. We've all read the book. Yeah. Like, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like, the, I mean, on the other hand, Sean Chan Damani on Toe Rocket is basically dragons breathing fire down right. at whatever scale you want. So, like, honestly, they totally could have gone full scorched earth genocide if they wanted. But clearly, the empire is built on assimilation. And so that's what they're going to try first. Especially if they tried it, you know, two years earlier before Rand and the Ashaman and... Um, you know, the sort of unification of the various women groups of channelers. Um, Just before Rand. With each other. If they had come yeah, before, before Rand, yeah. then... B yeah. BR. Yeah. <laughs> if they'd come 20 years ago, I mean, like, God, you know, that would have been a lot. Okay, so they're heading through a courtyard, and they come across all the Demani, and yes. so he notes that mm -hmm. half of them are sea folk. And there are a bunch of them. Just a little bit of foreshadowing for how he's actually going to get the Aes Sedai out, which is the sea folks, the sea folk prisoners who are very sullen and very angry and do not want to be prisoners. He's going to free them and he's going to use that as a distraction. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really sad and disturbing scene. Honestly, he just walks through this like crowd ish of various women who are in states of severe distress, have been stripped of who they are, they're imprisoned, and it's just like he walks through this just gallery of, of human suffering, and it's really painful. It's sad. Yeah. And one of them is Teslin, who they he specifically points out, like, they've been feeding more so that she's not so scrawny because she's someone who chooses not to eat as much as Matt or other people feel like she should. <laughs> we love body shaming on top of just having a slave quarter scene. It's great. <laughs> she's scrawny and looks like she's, you know, eats brambles instead of actual food. So yeah, whatever that they feed her that they've been making her eat so that she 
you know, fills out a bit because, you know, demanding have, demanding have to be healthy and, you know, et cetera. Everything that you do to take care of your animals so that they're... Well, they all need to meet the BMI in order to get the right tax write-off on their insurance. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> You know the Sean Chan have that kind of bureaucracy. But it is when when they don't control their own food intake, you end up having a certain regulation where it's like this is the healthy weight for our eyes. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so you control the calories. And and I can see Tesla being the kind of person who like would forget to eat normally unless someone told her to because she just doesn't have time for that business. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. So maybe, you know, being forced to eat on a regular basis is helping her, like, stick to a food schedule and may actually be more healthy for her. No, they they say it at one point that she's been fleshing out nicely since she learned to clean her plate. Yeah. It's really infantilizing because we're in the head of the of the Sewell Dom at the time. Mm-hmm, and it's just mm-hmm. like, I want to punch her so much. Yeah. And it's like she may just be someone who isn't super fond of food and some people aren't. And it's just sort of like if she's not technically sickly from it, then it's nobody's fucking business how much she eats. You know, so... But she's property, so... Mm-hmm. Right. <sighs> you, you forget that she's not a person. Like, so, I have clearly. a cat yeah. that's a little scrawny and is so ADD she forgets to eat. And it's kind of like, but I leave her alone because it's like she's not dying and she can still run around and act like an asshole, so it's just, like, good enough. <laughs> and the food's available. You know, if she got hungry enough, she'd eat it, right? Yeah, I have like, to keep yeah. the other one from eating it because, you know, he's he's fat and she's thin, and it's like they work together. It's fine. What's interesting to me with um, Timber, I give him steroids because he has a, a really bad skin allergy, and those are the only things that effectively seem to treat it. But him on steroids is this, like, hungry, like begging by the bull five minutes before it's time to feed him like that five o'clock that alarm goes off in his head and he's like food now off the steroids he'll leave his food bowl of food alone all morning he won't touch it he'll ignore it for for hours before walking over having a bite or two and then wandering away you know like the difference in body hormones and steroids really does change the appetite and how much he is driven to eat the food. And I imagine that affects all of us based on our natural, you know, hormone and steroid levels. Oh, yeah. When your body runs faster, um, it wants more energy. And <clears throat> that's what steroids do. So, yeah. It's timber on steroids. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you roided out, man. <laughs> well, Nabes is roided. I also figure that a lot of people eat when they're bored. Uh, I know I do. Mm-hmm. And yep, I do. The Manny aren't given intellectual stimulation, the kind of shit that Teslin's used to because she's an incredibly intelligent woman who reads books and writes letters and just does smart shit that smart people do to entertain themselves. So if she's sitting in a room with nothing to do, you know, you're probably going to clean your plate because you're bored and you're going to eat because what else is there? There's a couple of statements from Matt about these folks. Um, better than being dead, I suppose, which is one where he's later like, well, maybe not. Oh, yeah, boy. that's that's a tough one. Let's and talk we know, about where Matt's mind goes yeah. from there. And then, yeah, then, and then sort of immediately says, those silver Adam seem too much like the invisible collar Tylen had on him. So, yeah, that's that's a tough the spot to look at and be like, oh yeah, he's he feels like he's enslaved. He feels like he can't get away. He feels like that collar, although metaphorical, is just as effective at controlling his behavior. Now, how much of that? Again, I'll, I'll push back and say it might be a little unreliable narrator. Maybe he's not as caught as he thinks he is, but he likes to play the victim in his own head. So therefore, he's completely caught and he could never leave, even though maybe he could if he really tried. I mean, it says a little bit later that palace servants literally carried him bodily back from the docks. So at this point, he is definitely being kept as, you know, a slave and feels nec- like the need to like bring his money away in small amounts so she doesn't know like basically like a woman trying to leave an abusive relationship and you know get all her ducks in a row first um so that she can get out and her her husband or her boyfriend can't find her 
we've we've seen the comment about the docs before. We in this chapter get the whole well, if the servants approve, the servants know what's happening and they approve, and they think that if he's going to keep their queen happy, then they're going to make sure that that's where he is. So no, he can't leave. He can't leave. He is physically incapable of leaving. Doesn't mean he's not being a little dramatic because he knows he's going to be able to leave eventually, right? This whole thing is ine- inevitably temporary. He's either going to run away or she's going to let him go. He's being dramatic, but he is currently switching from thinking about, is it better to be dead than a slave? How does that relate to my situation? Like the fact that those thoughts are so close together in his head says a lot about how dire his situation is as far as the damage that is happening to him from it. It also, to a certain extent, because you're right, it is dramatic. And Matt always uses melodrama as a way to make light of terrible things for his coping mechanism. Like his his way of coping with traumatic and terrible things is to a certain extent to, you know, be melodramatic and hyperbolic and make light with kind of like dark humor, at least I always feel like Robert Jordan uses the three boys to express three different ways that men kind of deal with trauma, you know, either like punishing and taking, punishing themselves and taking blame for it or else being super stoic about it or else kind of like making light. And Matt is somebody who makes light. And so because this is horrifying, he's talking about how he's seen Damani basically beaten in the square. He was talking about how the cooks were flogged the first time that Surath had a meal. And I mean, flogging is no fucking joke, no. you know. So no. it's like people die from that all the time. Yeah, so it's a ridiculous level of punishment. They walk back into the city behind a bunch of severed heads. All of this is next level trauma type shit that, you know, he's been in battle. He's you dealt with stuff, but not this level of like institutionalized cruelty. And so having to kind of cope with it a little bit by doing that sort of mental drama slash humor in his head is it, that's standard matt but yeah it's a lot more dire than anything that we've kind of had before you're right um and then of course there's evidence right after that for my favorite pet theory which is vannon is demondred or at least a red herring for demondred oh, because matt was surprised he can read matt was surprised he could read right because oh my god the classes <laughs> Shay Vannon obviously is a horse thief and never bothered to learn to read, but the Mondred hiding as Shay Vannon absolutely would know how to read and would occasionally pick up a book, ruining his cover. Therefore, Vannon is still in my head the best candidate for Demondred. I love that because I underlined that line being like, why is RJ putting in this casual classism from Matt? But to keep your your tame and dread red herring going. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. Van and Dread. <laughs> Van, Van and Dread. Dread. <laughs> yeah, Van and Dread. It is Van and Dread now. But he's thinking lots of. Sh- he's thinking shitty thoughts about all of them. Like he thinks shitty thoughts about some of the uh, red arms. Oh yeah, this one's dumb. This one's slow. This one can't. Re- he's so mean. <laughs> In his head, he's so mean, and then he's like so responsible and takes care of uh-huh. them outside. It's just, ugh, Matt. <laughs> And then we get our first clue that Noel is Jane Farstrider because he tells the story of fighting the golem with Matt, and it's like he was a natural storyteller. As good as a gleeman. Because <laughs> he wrote the book. <laughs> I never realized he wrote the book. I always thought somebody else wrote the book. I, n- I never realized it was an autobiography. Yeah, J- Jane Farstrider wrote The Travels of Jane Farstrider. By Jane Farstrider. <laughs> Read for you by Jane Farstrider. Published by <laughs> Jane Farstrider Publishing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're putting a new headcanon into the headcanon library, which is the first thing that's happened in, like, years there. But we're headcanoning that Vannon is a highly educated lord who decided his family was bullshit and went in for, went in for horse thievery because it was more fun. This is headcanon from chat, and I will be taking no questions. Okay, I'll go with that and say that he's the youngest son, and so, you know, he uh, didn't have, like, a lot of promising things to go his way. So, yeah, why not be a horse thief? But plenty of opportunity to ride expensive horses and learn how to be mm-hmm. really good at that. Yep. Mm-hmm. It's amazing what a little dirt on your face will do to convince people that you aren't who you are. <laughs> For real. 
So we get a little bit of interaction with those red arms. Gord Duran and Fergin are the two that end up being killed by the Golom later in Knife of Dreams. Oh, right. is that the scene where he thinks that Oliver died? Also, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, right. It's like they survived Abudar, they survived all this stuff, and then they die as they're escaped. Yeah. So Harnan and Metwin are the only ones who live. Yeah, I think they actually go with him through um, Hinder's Tap. I think one of them is the guy that Matt goes back it's for. It's a different dude. I'm trying to think it of is? his name. Uh, Drat. I can't. But yeah, they, I mean, a few of these red arms stay with him through to when he takes over the armies of the world, I think. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, like I said, there's not that many left. There's only five, right? So <laughs> he picks up more um, spares when he meets up with Tom Manis. He's got the whole yeah, yes, band yes, at that does. point. He just took some like specific right. red arms, and uh, I don't know why he started calling them the red arms. But originally, the red arms were as an interchangeable thing. And every day, a group of people had to put the red sleeves on their arms and act as basically shore patrol, pretty much standard for when ships dock be the basically the designated drivers except that it's the desi- yeah the designated babysitters but yeah no it's like he sort of was like you are permanently red arms while we're on this away mission and the away mission has now stretched for like two freaking months and so there's just like this is the longest shift ever yeah for real <laughs> <laughs> they get lifetime exemption from that duty for the rest of their time in the band <laughs> But he tells them that the golem attacked them and then is like, I'll give you gold so you guys can leave. Passage on the first ship leaving for Ilion, take over, and maybe Tom and Julian will go. So he's just trying to get them out of there and have them find Talmanas because he doesn't want to lose any more of his people to the golem. And there's no point in them staying there while he's a prisoner because, honestly, it's easier just to escape on yourself than have to get everybody else out as well. A smaller party moves faster, for sure. But then... Right now, Talmanis is hanging out, what, with the king of Murindy? Yes. or Yeah. And he's being an army for him, getting some practical experience, basically, while he waits for, for Matt to show up, right on the border of Camelon. He's going to take off when the time is right, which is still a bit in the future. And then Matt thinks about how once they all leave, then he'll be all alone with Tylan. And that makes him wish that he was facing the Golom again instead, which is like melodrama. Tylan sucks. <laughs> Both things are true <laughs> at the same time. Like, I'm going to be... And he's not even getting support from these people. But still, the thought of having even their presence gone takes him back to how much he hates being with Tylan. Like, yeah. dude, talk to someone. Talk to your actual guys. <laughs> There's always truth in his melodrama. Like, he always th- is thinking about something that sucks. He just con- he just turns it into something that would suck a thousand times more. Yeah, that's his, <laughs> that's his MO. He's a grass is browner on the other side kind of Which thinker. is a positive <laughs> attitude. I appreciate that about him. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, we could all take a little bit of a hint from that. My life is awesome. Your life sucks. <laughs> Isn't that what everyone on Instagram is doing? We couldn't take a lesson in tact, but, mm. you know, other things. Yeah. They might be saying that on Instagram, but I think what they're showing is uh, desperation. You and every academic researcher who spent five minutes studying the problem ever. I'm, I'm quoting the experts on the shoulders of giants. <laughs> I love that Harnan says Talmanis would literally kill us if we left without you. And that's how he gets out of uh, avoiding Matt's offer and like gets Matt off the hook for making this a really long back and forth. He's like, literally, I'm more scared of Talmanis than I am of you. So, <laughs> Which, I mean, oh, the man can kill two fades. Uh, I'm a little scared of him, too. Yeah, for real. Noel sort of comments, hey, you know. Some men have an air about them that makes others men follow where they lead. Some lead to destruction, others to glory. I think your may- name may go down into history books. Says a man who wrote a book that's in history right. forever. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, been there, Uh-oh. done that, got the t-shirt. I can tell you're in line for the same t-shirt. But I think it's also just his leadership, you know, the offering his men, hey, you can go home if you want to, right? That does show, like, he cares about these men. And that then they choose to stay, says a lot about their history with him. Noel's like, I've known you people for five minutes, but 
Hmm. <laughs> Getting a lot of backstory in a few exchanges. And then there's this running joke where everyone who sees Matt says, oh, better clean up before Tylan sees you or else you're going to get in trouble. Every and he is single Every single person. person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah it, it's a lot. It's it's great because it's like he plans on, it, it says he intended to get himself clean before Tylan saw him. He did. But as he limped through the hallways hung with the flower tapestries, Ebudari called summer hangings for the season they evoked. Four serving men in the palace's green and white livery and those who were no fewer than seven maids suggested he might want to bathe and change his clothes before the queen saw him, offering to draw him a bath and fetch clean garments without her learning of it. And so it's just sort of like it begins to really he's a contrary person and you know it's sort of not quite oppositionally defiant but close enough and so it, it gets to the point where he runs into Julen and Julen makes a comment about his clothes because Julen gets upset with him they have like a little bit of back and forth um and he pisses Julen off. I think partly because Julen has been starting to see Amethera and and Matt is concerned because Tom and Beslin are starting to plan a kind of rebellion and Tom, uh, Matt is concerned that Beslin's going to get killed. And so he keeps referring to their foolishness. Um, and so he's asking Julen, are you involved with this foolishness? You know, and you guys should leave. Julian's like, I've got some shit going on. And Matt's like, take her with you. And if she won't go, well, you'll you'll not be in tear an hour before you have a woman on each knee. <laughs> it's just sort of like, okay. Yeah, that's Julian's helpful. like, I have met the woman of my dreams and I will not leave without her. And you're telling me I can just get another woman? You're full of mud. You are covered in mud. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a friend who... Another guy that we worked with, his fiance broke up with him, and he was like, oh, women are like buses, another will be along in ten minutes. So I was like, dude. <laughs> this is why you aren't getting hitched, <laughs> idiot. I'm like, bro, could you be any less sensitive? My God. Well, and I wonder if the pattern might be sort of forcing Matt to show up muddy, right? Because maybe a bit of Tylan's interest occurs because you have this noble man showing up all beat up and muddy, and like, if he showed up clean that wouldn't have captured her interest nearly as quickly. It's true. His mud does sort of focus the entire conversation that he's about to be in. So, and I mean, it's such a running joke. I mean, RJ has like 15 different people say this to him. Like the, the it's either a literal comedy or Taviran has some very strong hand in what's happening because it's obnoxious. And the, the pattern knows how he's going to react to that and be like, no, I won't get clean. Fine. And it's like, haha, that's going to attract the attention of two on the dice are rolling. If it had just been the servants, he would have gotten clean, too, because it's sort of like they're part of this whole humiliating. They're basically his jailers as well and part of this whole humiliating thing. But it's his friend telling him, I heard the queen was going to take a switch to you if you come back looking like you've been dragged in the street. And he was just at that point like, oh, hell no. You know, no, I'm done with this. You know, right now my friend is making fun of the abuse I'm suffering. Like, fuck you, dude. Yeah, no, I get, that makes sense. I hadn't quite... I thought it was just the fact that it was the 16th time, but you're right. Everyone else... Well, not all the Red Arms, but, like, the last 10 people he saw <laughs> were all his jailers, and now it's one of his friends again. Yeah, the, I mean, the Red Arms made a comment, but it's like Julian's mad at him for basically having an opinion about what he should do as far as a woman, basically saying, oh, women are like buses, another will be along in 10 minutes. And he's like, fuck you, dude. Partly because he doesn't know that he's seeing this terrorized and traumatized woman that was once a queen and is now a slave. And so doesn't understand the seriousness of it. And yeah, so Julian's basically like, how about shut the fuck up and keep your opinions to yourself? And then turns it around into a personal attack on Matt and hits him where it hurts the most. And so, and then Matt's like, oh, fuck this noise. And it's like, I'm going to go be muddy. Yeah, I love his dramatic entrance, too. Like, he stalks away from Julian and then, like, frisbees his hat across the room. <laughs> like, just absolutely launches it like a frisbee. I love the visual. 
Like, because I imagine that, like, the women are all sitting there, like, calmly drinking tea and talking, and it's all quiet and dignified. And then just this, like, flying saucer of, like, a muddy brimmed hat just, like, comes sailing right through as the doors come crashing open. It's beautiful. All right. Without looking, does Julian prefer to be called a thief taker or a thief catcher? A thief catcher. Catcher? I mean, go with Morgan, right? Morgan's going to be right on that <laughs> yeah. one. Yeah. I'm trying to play the audio back in my head, and I'm pretty sure that it's never Taker, not him. I'm pretty sure that's the... that's the. <laughs> that was hard, though. So we get we get that joke again reoccurring. I know, isn't it one of those things? Because always, they always pair it up. It's Thief Catcher, not Taker. And you're like, wait, which one is it again? Yeah. <laughs> we love dyslexia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he always mentions them together, which is frustrating. And only with respect to Julian. As long as there's anyone else that ever functionally takes this role. Yeah, the only other thief taker you hear about is Huron, and they only mention him specifically as a thief taker, like, at the beginning of The Dragon Reborn, and they're like, he's a thief taker for the King of Shinar. Yeah. And Julian's like, I'm not that. I'm definitely not that. And they're like, why? What's the difference? Because you have to catch the thief before you can take him somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) It's like the, the next stage. I, I thought maybe Taker is someone who works for a king and Catcher is someone who works, uh, you know, privately. But again, even that didn't really necessarily make sense to me. It's an arbitrary bureaucratic distinction for sure. Like whatever it is, it's only someone in that profession would care. Yeah, I think it's probably just semantics. And Julian's like, you know, what the fuck does it even mean? Where am I taking him? No, I'm catching him. And so he's just somebody where that annoys him, which... As somebody who's particular about things, I can sympathize. I'm also an adult, and I would never actually argue with people about it. I would just keep it to myself and be privately annoyed. Um, (laughs) I kind of imagine the difference between, like, a bondsman and a bounty hunter, right? Like, one of those has a certain connotation that goes with it. But, you know, for us, we we don't... Thief Taker doesn't have that connotation, but maybe for Julian it does. Yeah, that seems like a fair comparison. Do you think uh, thief catchers and thief takers have to have their name end with I-N? you got Huron and Julian. Yes. Yeah, I think you have to change your name. Uh, j- your station. Totally, yeah. 100%. For doing sneaky mm-hmm. judicial work. Yeah. Yep. Right. Huron's name used to be Hur, and then he became a thief taker. Yeah, so it's, a, it's an honorific title. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it used to be Jewel. Yeah. Now it's yeah. Julian. Yep. Clearly the simplest explanation. So, Matt Taviran bombs their meeting. <laughs> right, the queen and... So, who's in the room, right? We've got Queen Tylan, Suroth, Tuon, Samaraj, Salusha, and then a bunch of Dakovail. Yeah. I think just Dakovail. I don't think there's any Damani. No. It's just Dakovail. And then there's a couple of yeah. Mitsubar servers yeah. as well. He has a whole ream of servants like around the edge of this, but Matt is so used to living the high and mighty life, he barely thinks about them. Beyond the fact that because the Daco Vale wears sheer robes, so he thinks about, you know, the fact that people are naked and you can see naked people, but other than that, yeah. Right. And the fact that there's wine. Wine also right, catches wine. his interest. <laughs> and also the fact that the dice stop mm-hmm. dead the second That's he throws his hat across thing. the room. Right. The really important thing is Matt strode in, sailed his hat across the, the room, dot, dot, dot. That's when the, the dice stop rolling. And stop dead, his mouth hanging open, and everything he'd planned to say frozen on his tongue. Why? Not because he's shocked by who's in there, but because the dice stopped. Why did the dice stop? Two on. Two on. He me. He's meeting two on, which is what they were rolling for. And in the past chapter, we talked about how the dice in his head started when two on, you know, basically arrived in the continent, and they end with him meeting her. And he. And it's so funny too because they don't tell you why he's shocked, but they also tell you he's shocked because like inconsequential things leap out at him, and so then you get a good look around the room while being like, "What is bothering Matt?" And then at the end of all that you learn that it's because the dice stopped. But yeah, it's the cinematic. Like, he throws the frisbee and then just freezes. Or the hat, like a frisbee, and then just is like stone. Like, well, the hat moves and everyone is sitting there looking at him and he's just frozen and the hat is the only thing in the room that's moving as it settles to the ground. It was not the presence of Suroth or the strangers that jerked him to a halt, though. The dice had stopped, landing with the thunder that made his skull ring. That had never happened before. So never that, like, sudden stop, right? Like... Biggest, most momentous 
event that has ever occurred in his life is him needing to on. And he's just like, but nothing's happened. There's supposed to be a Forsaken jumping out of the fireplace. It's like, no, dude, she's already there. Like, the Forsaken no, no, is standing chilling. next to the fireplace. She's not right, in right. it. She's about to throw a wine yeah. cup into it. But, yeah. and he's like waiting for a Forsaken as his eyes pass over a Forsaken, who's not even wearing a disguise. Like, that's literally the face of Semarok. He comments, he's like, gosh, she doesn't even have the accent that, you know, everybody else has. Weird. <laughs> yeah, a slender woman nearly as dark as her stark black ground and gown and tall even had she been Aiel, right? So super weirdly tall. Like one of the tallest people in the whole cast and like right, also right. one of the blackest people in the whole cast. And then she behaves in like the weirdest way within what little we know about the Shawchan structure. It's right. she's and her so head, head's not shaved at all, right? Mm-hmm. So no she, accent, like, no head shave, no, no nail right. uh, trimmings. And like she makes Tuon bend, but Tuon makes Suroth nervous and Suroth treats Anoth like like a survey it's very very circular and weird it's fun and meanwhile the whole time tuan's acting like a queen even though she's dressed like a you know i don't know he's like she's she's got enough rubies she's dressed in enough rubies to live on she is dressed but she's dressed like a little girl not like an adult well not dressed like he's perceiving her as a little girl and just seeing she's draped in rubies but i mean she's absolutely like royal level dress up but it's like oh it's just sean shan high blood Mm. gee i wonder if having all of her fingers lacquered may it means anything Hmm. It's like I don't know. Have you, know, her whole so have you not noticed? Right, more lacquered nails means more power, and she has all of them lacquered. Gee, and her head is shaved, and we know that shaved hair like has other signifiers. So she's got all the nails right. and no hair. It follows, Matt. You're not stupid, mm-hmm. <laughs> but he's in no, shock. Just shocked, and then and. Tylan's been talking to him and he doesn't even hear her. And finally, she's like, you aren't listening to me. Go down to the kitchens, have a pastry, take a bath. And he's still like so quiet and in shock. And that gives two in the opportunity to be like, he got mugged. And you said the streets were safe. I'm pissed, Surath. What the fuck? You know, you've fucked up several times. And now she feels like Surath was dishonest with her about the state of the city. This is going back to not telling your fascist leaders the things they don't want to hear (laughs) and her being like, wait a minute. Are you telling me what I want to hear instead of what's actually going on? No. All it is is a smoothie. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. (laughs) I love this. It's like, I assure you two on the streets of Ebudar as safe as the streets of Shandar itself, Surath replied, and that pulled Matt out of his stupor. She sounded anxious. Surath made other people anxious. (laughs) It's just like... (laughs) I love Mm -hmm. that line. (laughs) Surath makes Mm -hmm. other people anxious. I also wonder how many people do actually get assaulted on the streets of Shandar and it just doesn't get reported because, you know, it was the cops assaulting sex workers or whatever. And let's just go back. Don't forget, dark friend alert with Suroth, right? She's the one who had the whole um, pact with uh, Leandrin to take away our Supergirls in freaking Great Hunt. Right. Yeah. And also there's earlier in this chapter, Matt's like, Suroth doesn't know who I am. And I'm like, dark friend social says otherwise. Was she at the Dark Friend Social? Absolutely, 100%. Whether or not she was at the Dark Friend Social, that information has definitely percolated to her pay grade, I would think. The funniest thing about it is it's sort of like, if that's so, like... The people at the Dark Run Social got, like, visuals of the boys, but it's like the other Forsaken didn't, because later on when they get told, hey, you need to kill Matt and Perrin... Samaraj is like, you know, it would have been really useful if you had told us this before and, like, you know, shown us the pictures because Matt was under her eye for ages. And if she had just you know, seen the photo and photo and been like, you know, Bolo for this dude, she would have, you know, killed him at the time. And so she's annoyed at more than stupidity or lack of foresight. Yeah, it's pretty clear here that Anoth slash Samarog has no idea who Matt is. Yeah. I. Okay galaxy brain shrinking down to little pea brain i always assumed that everyone knows who the taverans are ah shamael is not sharing that because don't forget for shamael well for dark friends are loyal to shamael right like they're not necessarily loyal to the dark lord they swore an oath to baalzaman who is a shamael I never thought about it that way. Hmm. Right? Kind of like Christians 
needing to have Jesus as like their inner intermediary. But that's why Lan- Lanfear calls Dark Friends foolish, right? Because they're worshipping a man, another Forsaken, who she doesn't respect. So she's like, those foolish Dark Friends, they're dumb, right? Like... Yeah. A lot of the early Dark Friends have, have literally given their souls over to Ishamael in particular. And so he's the one who is showing them the images, right? They're not really loyal to the other Forsaken, and Ishamael is not sharing that information with any of the other Forsaken. And Ishi's not really doing Dark Friendy things with any Atha on Shadar. They're kind of off doing their own thing, apparently. I can't believe I never thought about this. Oh, wow. I never thought of it either. That's kind of deep. Shit. I'm going to need a minute. <laughs> so, so Ishii's basically like Dark Jesus. Uh, okay. <laughs> which works because he's the opposite of Light Jesus, which is Rand, oh, right? And the God. whole like, bonding of souls. That works yeah. way too oh. well. Mm-hmm. Okay. Lucifer! <laughs> I mean, I always put Lucifer and LTT together because the rising, the morning star yeah, and all it's, that. But... It's never a one-to-one, right? There's definitely a little bit of, of both of those. But, like, uh, you know, Rand isn't just Thor, right? Or just Arthur. Because, or just Arthur, right. or, you know. Um, yeah, no, for because, sure. For and there's sure. aspects of, of Thor in both, you know, and Odin in both Matt and Perrin and Rand, right? Thor in particular, is, there's a lot of him in Perrin. Also um, Perun. 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 Yeah, Perun. Perun. Yeah, Perun. There's a lot of Perun. There's a lot of Perun and Perun. I will admit that, yeah. But, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of, yeah, Ishii as the, you know, the Antichrist. Oh, dude. Quite literally, the anti-Jesus that is Rand. I mean, I, I just never thought about the fact that he was kind of, and being an intermediary, dark friends actually, you know, swearing themselves to him and never really, you know, but it makes sense. It's sort of like makes sense to have a much more you know human interface with the dark one because it's easier to understand and sometimes that's just easier for people for their their spiritual needs to oh, and i think that's what added to the confusion around whether with whether Baal was the dark one right because not only did he think he was but people were swearing to him like he was right man oh man but but and also if you think about it right dark friends came up after the last battle right or they came out they came not the last battle after the breaking the boring the breaking the, 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 boring, the dark one more like the warring and so none of the people who were out could have worshipped really would have had any contact with anyone except the shamael who came out every thousand years for 40 years so he can sort of establish the dark friends and the black aja in that oh, time shit. and for me, I always thought the big difference between Dreadlords and, and just the Black Aja, the Black Aja is worshipping Shamael in particular. Mm. And Dreadlords are at work for the Dark One. Oh, man. But a lot of that's semantics, right? I'm not sure if that really makes that big of a difference. Making but... a big difference to both of us. Yeah. I'm just kind of like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> like, just sitting with this being like, cosmic. Bro. Yeah, but yeah, it, Lanfear's statement that dark friends are idiot. They worship Baalzamon, and I was like, why? Why would she think the ones that isn't she a dark friend? And it's like no, because dark friends worship another Forsaken, and she would never bow down to anyone other than the Great Lord. Ah, uh, I mean, I'm sure only Forsaken like give a shit about these semantics, but like, it's still relevant to our god scale view Mm -hmm. damn and that's why you don't necessarily see other forsaken dealing with dark friends really no very very rarely we mainly see that interaction i mean it happens but yeah not it does happen yeah 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 (sighs) oh wild well that's just i don't even know i don't Mm -hmm. even know that's gonna just come back again and again yeah (laughs) <laughs> okay. Okay. <sighs> Moving on. <laughs> so Tuwin's upset with Surath. She was always up, already upset with her because th- of the go- pushing east to Ilion. That was not part of the plan. So the whole battle um, that she had with Rand was actually not okay. Which makes sense because you want to establish a beachhead and give people a chance. Let the whole return take over and then we can expand east. But you pushed it too fast, too far, too quickly. 
and that stinks of trying to take your own power to over to you know declare independence basically and well and it would have probably been fine if she had succeeded and then handed over that control then it would have been a bold move that might get her elevated but because she failed it was a dumbass decision she never should have tried but then it also makes her look suspicious because when you succeed too much with the Shanchen and you're in a position of power, then you have to watch out too, which is, they exhaust me. It's just like Jesus, you know? On the heights, the paths are paved with Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> they're paved with bullshit. That's what yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it's exhausting. It's exhausting the way the Shanchen. Behavior. Yeah, I just, I just, you know what? How about you be in charge? I'm going to do something else because I just don't have the energy for this crap. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, there's this whole thing where like Suroth is basically looking at Tylan to try to deflect some anger and like is basically blaming Tylan because her pet is getting her into a bad light. And then Tylan like takes the blame and gives Matt this look and Matt's like, oh, I'm going to pay for that later. And it's just so much stupid petty soap opera by play, just little eyes flicking everywhere. Ugh. Do you think Suroth knows that Anoth is Samraj? Not yet. No, she, I don't think so. She shows up later, I think, in the beginning of, I think in the prologue of Knife of Dreams, she shows up and lets her know that she's killed the entire um, family. <laughs> yeah, the that's Imperial when she family. reveals herself mm -hmm. and what she's doing. Yeah. So yeah, at this point, she's in ignorance and is just thinking that this is the truth speaker. Yeah, and which is why she's like, why don't you kill her? Or she threw your shit in the fire and... He's like, you don't, you don't get it. You know? mm -hmm. So here's where we get the line that's, you know, Suroth. The, the two familiar Sean Chan draw seemed almost absent entirely. Yeah, for real. And then she defends Suroth's actions. Because, again, she probably mm -hmm. gave a lot of those orders more or less directly. Right. <laughs> so she's like, it's fine. That was a great plan. Stop messing with it. <laughs> she also wants Suroth to stay in place because Suroth is someone she can manipulate and control pretty easily. She doesn't have to manipulate her. She can just order her directly. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, she doesn't want to have to deal with someone who would need manipulation. Right. Manipulate her easily. Just tell her what to do. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That is that is a kind of manipulation. I will grant you that. Um, and I like, you know, they're talking about Matt and Tuan says, you know, time and omens will tell because she's had omens about this man already, I think. She doesn't know that he's who he is until she sees his ring though is what she says later on that's yeah. true next yeah, page yeah. it's on and the next page moment, yeah. but I love how because it's sort of like Suroth glares at Tylan and Tylan like bows her head and Matt speaks to try to deflect the situation because he's going to pay for it even though he should in no stretch of the imagination say anything in this scene. But he's just so very mad. And so he's just sort of like, oh, I just fell down and is being very cheeky about the whole thing. So it says, Suroth and Tuan looked shocked that he had spoken. Tylan looked like an eagle who wanted her rabbit fried. And so... Yeah, he just completely breaks all of the rules of propriety. And for Shanshan particularly, it seems like a great way to get yourself killed. And yeah, it's just kind of like trying to defuse the situation by lying. And then at that point, Samaraj throws Tuan's wine into the fire and insults her. Yeah, Matt's cheekiness throughout this whole exchange is just like, this is how he gets through everything. He just does his insolent thing and is just so cheeky and gives his big grin and everyone's just like, how can I stay mad at you? And it really doesn't work on the Shan Shan very well, but he has yet to learn that. And so she, she gives his inspection to him, is kind of inspecting him because she's being like she, he's obviously lying you know he couldn't have sustained this falling unless there's cliffs in the city i haven't seen <laughs> and he's like oh i was hurt you know when i was hurt when the city fell and so she is looking at him and she's like you fought us you've sworn the oath and he's like i swore for the other i had no chance and it says so sh so you would have she murmured which is sort of like because he would have fought that would have made it possible to take him property so it's almost like she feels entitled to buy him just because he would have fought them if he had had the chance. Oh, I never interpreted that line that way. I, that's, that's a good, yeah, I like that. I, I mean, I like that. I just always thought it was just sort of like, oh, so you're a fiery one. Like, I never read deeper into that. But she's like, no, you could have been a spoil of war. And that's why. 
Mm. Yeah. If Fast. I'm... I like that so much better than my stupid interpretation. <laughs> it's way deeper. Yeah. Yeah. I think that she feels super intrigued by him for all kinds of reasons. And then it's just sort of like, but a sense of ownership of him from the beginning, even before she gets a look at his ring, because she's like, he would have fought. And that makes him automatically a slave, basically. And he's obviously a prized toy of Thailand, which means that, you know, the newest kid in the nursery wants to take all the cool toys for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Just as a show of dominance. Like, no, you don't get to have that. That's mine, right? Dogs do this all the time, right? Humans do it with their dogs all the time. (laughs) Can we talk about how if he had washed, he would never would have been caught in the lie of, you know, not being attacked. She never would have inspected them. She she never would have seen the ring, right? The whole, like, I go back to, it was Taviran. Everyone telling him that uh, he needed to get cleaned up. Absolutely. It was Taviran being like, no, do not get cleaned up. Right? <laughs> we, we definitely, the pattern needs you to be dirty. So Tuan will see your ring. And what I love about Matt's Taviran is so much of what is... Matt's process of being Taviran is just like, all you've got to do is be yourself, Matt. Sort of like, you know, <laughs> oh, go to Roydian. What do I have to do in Roydian? Just be yourself, you know? And so it's like, you know, oh, I see this doorway. Huh, I wonder if I can get what I need done there. It's like, if we just put you there, you'll find the doorway and you'll go through it because of course you will, you know, because you're Matt. And so, yeah, here it's like, you're going to get talked to and told to, you know, get take a bath and change your clothes just often enough that you're going to be mad and you're going to get your back put up and you're not going to do it. And then you're going to make a scene. And it's just, it's great because it's like, does wonderful things for his characterization. It's it like adds an extra layer to the Taviran mechanic that I really like. The one time that I really don't like the, how that works is when Varen gives him the oh, letter and says, that. oh, Ugh. you're in nature. I hate that. It's such a counter example that like it's it, it's one of those ways where I say Sanderson clearly just didn't understand no, that I, because like didn't understand to that, Varen. That, I mean, that whole sequence no, is so off. That's so weird. It's just like, why? Why would he not? Something would have forced him to open that letter in time. Right, like, and it's utterly unnecessary since he doesn't open it anyway. They might have just, they might as well just have had like, oh look, Camelot's on fire. You know, there's no right, need for it right. whatsoever. And right, and Varen experiencing this like obnoxiously heavy-handed, cartoonish, like being kept in the mountains by Taviran. It's just yeah, no, that's 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 not necessarily my favorite Matt interaction that was written. I, I really sort of... Wait, are we, are we critiquing Matt or are we critiquing Taviran? Because I thought we were critiquing Taviran. I think we're, at this point, where we are, we're critiquing Sanderson's. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was going to say, San- Sanderson's interpretation of both of those is what I'm critiquing. Is like, I don't think it's particularly well... I, th- I think that Sanderson didn't fully understand what Jordan was trying to do with Taviran and Matt. And he wrote this, what he thought would be a funny little situation that Matt's stubbornness would screw up. But it's like, no, Matt's stubbornness has to f- put him in the right situation. That's how that works. You did it backwards. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where his stubbornness kept, prevented the pattern from putting him in the right situation. No, his stubbornness has to put him in charge of the band of the red hand. His stubbornness has to put him in, you know, in a place where he can, you know, ask six questions and get them all answered, right? Like, instead, when Sanderson wrote him, his stubbornness caused <laughs> Camelin to fall. And it's just like, wait, what? That yeah. doesn't make sense. Yeah. Nodding. So Semarash tells Tuan to just buy Matt so she can go to bed. And at that point, Tuan looks at the ring and stops and then immediately stares up straight into his face and is like, good idea. How much? (laughs) If he's your favorite, I'll double your price. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, he either has to be directly opposed to something or do it absolutely randomly. That's when his Taviran can can pop through. And then I love that Tylan's immediate reaction is to choke on her wine and be like, even I wouldn't go that far. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Like, I just, I yeah. love her reflexive rejection of that idea. Like, no, he's a free man. Everything I've done, I have done mental gymnastics to justify. That uh-huh. is too blatant uh-huh. and, and uh-huh. Oof, uh-huh. no, no, no. <laughs> No, there is that, like, if is he a free man? Because you're not treating him like one. That's for damn right, sure. Right, but she's also the first person to be like, wait a second. It's just, there's, there's a lot from Dylan to unpack there. Yeah, for real. 
I don't think we need to, but I think she needs to unpack that. She needs to. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, I have to wonder if maybe that doesn't change her attitude towards him a little bit. That that's not one of the reasons that she then lets him go and sort of gives him that permission. And even though she knows that he's fleeing, she's like, okay, yeah, you, you have to leave. Um, and I have to wonder if maybe she doesn't think back, you know, that, that night when he ties her up to the bed, if she's not thinking back to this moment and being like, yeah, maybe I did try and kind of own you. And that may not have been totally kosher. We should keep an eye on her behavior as we get between here and there we and should. see if her and Matt's, tenor changes at all i could see this being a turning point for her where she's like oh no he's a free man Ooh, he's a free man i should probably not be treating him like a slave yeah yeah i mean the mental gymnastics are bullshit so once that hole gets poked right the whole house of cards in your head comes falling down in theory yeah it's like if i detest these people and resent what they're doing do i want to make myself any more like them than i have to to survive and this is definitely not a requirement um, to keep my people safe and my throne. And then it's like, obviously, she's really unnerved by it. And so, and Tuin doesn't understand why. So it, her voice is unsteady when she's like, he's a free man, I can't sell him. And at that point, she's, Tuin is really nice because Tuin is a genuinely nice person, which is one of the reasons I dislike her so much because. <laughs> <laughs> because she's so likable in so many ways, and because she doesn't think herself out of her bullshit when she's smart and likable, and I really wish we had gotten the outlier novels, because I'm assuming Jordan eventually planned for her to have that character growth, and because we never got it, it just makes me sad and frustrated with her. But yeah, she is immediately very kind to Thailand and, you know, and you see all of these moments of kindness later on, like, you know, she's kind to Matt when she catches him coming out of the Demani kennels uh, and realize, and he makes up the story about, oh, I just wanted to get like something sweet for one of the Windfinders because she did me a favor uh, because she likes to train Demani. Basically, she's fond of dogs, you know, and when other people are nice to animals, she appreciates that. And, and it's like the the Death Watch guard who mm -hmm. follows her, right? Who's loyal to her. What's Fury his name? Uh, means, uh, Freak Greed, right? She's been, one of the reasons he's so loyal is because of her kindness to him, that she was kind her to him. Her interpersonal when, kindness, know. not her political significance or who her mother no. was, but because she gave him a doll. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that's that's the kind of person she is, which is, I think, again, I don't know why I'm going off on this, but where I, th I think a Sanderson miss was is this inability of her to accept that maybe she's not treating this old mom correctly. Right. And it's like, no, she really should have had some some come to Jesus moments on that and really sort of realized that maybe she was doing the wrong thing. Yeah, maybe I'm being unfair to her and I should just complain that Sanderson wasn't fair to her character, but I don't like to complain too much because having to finish the series is an utterly thankless task and not a job I would have wanted. And because I'm overall pretty satisfied with it, I don't like to talk too much shit about how Sanderson did because, you know, nobody's going to be pleased with everything. Yeah. No, but I can. I but I feel like at the same time I can be like, here's here's where I think Jordan would have done a better mm -hmm. job. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. And th there's definitely places where I think Sanderson did a better job, right? Like I I've read Sanderson and his battles are awesome, right? And the fact that one of the, the whole third book is just one big battle is kind of really cool. And he writes the emotional ups and downs really well. And you know, it's just it's some of the characters that he just didn't. And you, you can't. Get. You know, that's a hit or miss thing, and it's nobody's fault right. so yeah yeah because he's he was he's not writing the characters he doesn't know all the things that jordan wrote, wrote, wrote about yeah them, characters so. are a manifestation of people and you can't fake that so but yeah no it's uh it, it is fun that tuan has that sort of complexity where it's like you are so nice as a person and you are so not using your power and privilege to make the world any better <laughs> Like, she, I like that she's complicated. I mean, I could do with maybe slightly more resolution to that complication by the end. But I like that she starts out like a full on like swirl of, of feelings. Yeah. The first POV you get from her, she's so like the total tone is so pleasant and likable and just like she's obviously got so much fundamental decency, which is why it's such a struggle for 
you know, somebody with that capacity for intelligence because, you know, but also a sense of obligation to hold up a corrupt system. You know what I would have loved? I would have loved to see her and Egwene become friends. Oh, like, give it a few centuries. But seriously. But yeah. yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. Like, not right away, but like that level of like coming around and realizing how wrong she was about a former Demane would have been real character growth for her. Yeah. Yeah. The moment when she takes her opportunity for growth and just doubles down and doesn't get called out on it is just so Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's so fun. There's so much opportunity for us as the audience to go through a growth moment with her. And we get denied that. And it's set up so well because of how complicated she is. Like there's so such a good springboard for us to have that process vicariously. That that moment when Matt says, oh, yeah, no, she was Damani. Well, not for very long. And Tuan's like, oh, how dare you force me to speak with a former Damani? No, that's not what your reaction should have been. Her reaction should have been like, oh, my God, this person who I was speaking of and I thought was like a political opponent used to be a former Damani. And she's clearly in control. And maybe I need to rethink my like uh, biases. Yeah. Something. Yeah. But. No. <sighs> but- yeah, so we really need some, uh, you know, Outrigger fanfic, I think, basically, at this point, right? For sure. Everyone should go search AO3, because it's probably there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, Yeah. I feel like it's maybe unfair to her character to be so frustrated with her, because, you know, there are other things that I feel, other characters where I feel like things are written that are unfair to them, and I overlook those things so you know i don't have as high of hopes of those characters though fair tuan is just on a special tier of things that like i could be disappointed by everyone else is like whatever but she's just uh i don't know the higher they go the higher the fall the higher the climb the farther the fall right it's just an amplitude thing she's the empire she's the top of an empire like i have an empire's worth of expectations riding on her personal growth (laughs) yeah and so much potential for it and just you know and she doesn't need to be perfect but just something give me something so then he goes and talks to tyler a little bit and she basically says no the golem can't have you and neither can she you're mine yeah but you're a free man (laughs) totally totally you're free to stay here with me and not be her property also we should have two ones like hey you should come check out these maps i have great masseuses like, what kind of, like, privileged nonsense that she's like, we should go to strategy. Also, I have great massage artists. Like, in what world do you get a massage while looking at maps? Well, my a future, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, wouldn't be the worst thing. I love maps. The massages are great. I just don't know. Yeah. I, I want to focus on one or the other. That sounds distracting. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, well, come on. You you would you would mind a little uh, shoulder rub while you're working on GIS stuff? I mean, that would be great. Right, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. This is not a bad thing. All right, I'm convinced. I need a masseuse with my next update <laughs> of Arc. <laughs> okay. Anyway, sort of brings us. We're getting close to the end of this chapter. Yeah. Do you recall the pink ribbons? When I get back, we'll see how you look in pink. Mm-hmm. And and Brent, he he thinks about how like he never should have tried to get his own back with her. So mm-hmm. um, this is definitely you like. There's a lot of of stuff for you to fill in in your mind's eye. There's a lot of stuff. This is Jordan as close as Jordan gets to writing a sex scene. Is him, is Matt reflecting on sexy times with somebody? Even the Golom did not occupy much of his thoughts. <laughs> his mind is <laughs> elsewhere. <laughs> uh huh. Actually, no, most of what he's focused on is the dice. It's not the pink ribbons. Um, the dice is what's actually bothering him because mm-hmm. he still hasn't sorted it out. And he's just sitting there worrying about the dice until the pink ribbons forcibly become the thing that is uppermost in his mind for the close of the chapter. Any of the time, those pink ribbons would have had him gibbering. He never should have tried to get his own back with her. Even the golem did not occupy much of his thoughts. I think it should say as much of his thoughts, honestly. It should. I'm agreeing. I feel like, the, yeah, even the golem did not occupy as much of his thoughts. I think that's a typo. The dice had stopped and what? He had come face to face or near enough with three people he had not met before. But that could not be it. Maybe it was something to do with Tylan becoming one of the blood. But always before when the dice stopped, something had happened to him personally. 
He sat there worrying over it while the serving woman called in others to carry everything away, sat there until Tylan returned. She had not forgotten about the pink ribbons, and that made him forget about anything else for quite a long time. I just like that, the idea that meeting your future spouse is an event that you in the moment will never know is significant to you. That it's is true. kind of a cool idea, yeah. And that only later, as you look back on your life, are you like, oh, this was a significant time in my life. That meeting, that was the thing that really my whole life spun on is this this interaction I had, and I had no idea at the time. And Matt has some idea at the time, but he doesn't know why it's important, right? So that's that's what the dice give him, is like, this is an important thing in your life. You won't know why, you won't know how until much later, and it'll be much more significant later. But, you know, it, it, it gives him the clue that one of those three people he met is really important. He even thinks that. Like, I met these three people. Yeah, which, yeah. that's two on... Anoth Solution? Yeah, Doesn't Solution. Say he's counting? I guess, yeah, because he's met... Surath already. Well, you know, he, he knows who Surath is, but maybe he never met her, so he could oh, be Oh, because he does say Surath doesn't know who I am. So, right. okay, okay. Because so, I was like, I don't feel like he'd be counting Solution because she's obviously staff. Uh, right. Right. <laughs> think... So I, I think Tuan, Surath, and Anoth? Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, because there, it's the weird three-way dynamic with who's who's on top. It's very um, Escher. Right. Matt's looking at it. it looks like an Escher right. power hierarchy. So yeah, that must be who it is. And it's we we know it's the future partner of his. But I mean, honestly, Surath and Samaraj affect him a lot, if indirectly. And I think, you know, he's been in Sora's presence before. The notion that she doesn't know who he is more has to do with she does not see people unless they are of a certain status. And the fact that right. he made a scene and became seen to her is significant in its own way, which is why she looked shocked. Like, all of the women look shocked, but especially her and Tuan, because that's just not something people do. Clearly, yeah. No, and well, Matt doing something other people <laughs> don't do? I mean, that's, that's his M.O. <laughs> He's just such a rascal. <laughs> right? Well, that was a fun chapter. Is there anything we, anything else we missed or want to talk about? That's, that's all my notes. Um, thanks so much, Morgan, for, for coming and, and making time yeah, really for this. Yeah, really appreciate it. It's really good to have you for this chapter. And playing hooky at work. I really, really appreciate that. Yeah, I feel... Well, no, I don't even really feel bad about it. telling a radio that I have uh, Sunday and Monday off because my wife and I are going to the beach so it didn't seem right to call in sick but then I was sort of like I've got work to do on my own podcast and my process is real sticky right now and so I better just take the time off and if I can get it all done today then I can actually stay late and give them the time that they want the next few days and then maybe they won't think I'm such a flake or I don't really care what they think but <laughs> podcasting before bullshit for people that don't care I mean at least sometimes I've been pretty good about giving them time I worked a lot of hours last week but it's just kind of like I decided I'm not gonna if I push off my podcasting too much or I don't invest enough time in it it's gonna make me unhappy which is gonna make me anxious and then I'm gonna have an issue with my mental health and it's gonna affect my performance at work anyway so I just might as well if they want to have a conversation with me about it I'll just tell them so I have this podcast and there are times I'm gonna prioritize it and as long as I'm here for you know eight hours you can live with that or not in which case I'll find another job just let me know well it's not like you don't have they they give you sick time right well I haven't earned any yet but I don't need it because like with between when the overtime you know the overtime will cover the difference and 
the way we do our our finances um I'm able to like I can I have wiggle room so it's not like going to kill me to miss you know a day's pay here and there so mm-hmm well, I'm glad that you came and worked with us because it's more yeah, fun. I'm, I'm glad, yes. <laughs> and hopefully that gets you on a nice, nice trajectory to go work on your podcast. To keep, yeah, right. Yeah, I'm gonna go try to fix it and remind myself that even if my rough no- draft notes are an abomination and don't make any sense, I can often record a decent episode, even so, and usually turn that into a good final draft. And so I shouldn't let myself get too discouraged because. It looks Trust yeah, the it's a shit show right now. I'm like, I'm gonna just keep dragging my just power feet. through. Yeah, power through. The only way out is through. What's the uh, topic that you're hit, trying to hit on this time? Forsaken fuckery. So, it's... oh, that's a nice narrow topic. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think so, but it's sort of like I'm trying to touch on like all of the forsaken shit that's going on in the fires of heaven. Um, and I was trying to figure mm. out what would be the that's best way one. to approach it because. There's just a lot of angles I could go at, and I don't want to have, like, a four-hour episode, and so I was finally kind of deciding to approach it from, you know, what it's like to, you know, enter the world after a 3,000-year coma and try to figure your shit out and who's better suited for it and kind of the way that, you know, shit gets done. And also, what is Lanfear really doing? Because, you know... (laughs) Mm, Fun. I have opinions, you know. (laughs) I think I go. I think you can go back and listen to the Fire of Heaven's episodes, and we talked about that quite yeah, a bit. It is, um, it all, it's still like you know her her game, at least for the rest of that book. And but yeah, it's just kind of interesting because we you know get to explore some arcs, and it's sort of like it seems like some of the Forsaken are goal oriented, and others are not so much. And so it's interesting to look at what depending upon who has certain skills or proclivities, what they choose to do. And mm-hmm. also what Jordan mm-hmm. likes to do with them narratively, depending upon what they're good at. So, But it's a vague kind of topic, and trying to decide what right. to write about and what to do with it is making me kind of insane. And so I'm just going to finally just go with it. And if it sort of sucks, I don't even care. I'll just make the episode and move on to the next one. They're not all going to be good ones. So. Yep. yep. I, I don't know. I think yours are all pretty good. I've yet to hear a dud, so. Well, even when they're not, like, the best, I am content enough. Like, that's the thing about talking about somebody else's stuff, is that you can just be good enough and be satisfied with it. You know, when it's your own shit, it's never perfect enough, or at least not for me. So yeah. it's but, another- like... Don't no. let perfect get in the way of progress. Right. right? Mm-hmm. Perfect gets in the way of good. Or adequate, even. So. Yeah. I mean, making yeah, something yeah. rather than stewing in one spot, right? Mm-hmm. Forward motion mm-hmm. in any way. Yeah. So I'm just going to do it and I'll, uh, yeah, have a little wee, talk it out. And yeah, it might be a shit show. But that's the nice thing about being able to do the final draft is, you know, I'll listen to the rough draft several times mm-hmm. you know so i'll pro- put it on repeat at work probably for about two days and i've got a sticky pad and i just take notes as it occurs to me and then i kind of incorporate those notes into the google drop google doc of the final draft as i kind of fix it up and um it helps me make a much more cohesive argument or whatever the fuck the shit i'm trying to say is a lot more cohesive than mm-hmm. the garbage that i just mumble the first time so so everyone make sure to check that out forsaken fuckery on podcast the dragon coming to a podcast feed near you at some point <laughs> i'd say the level of work you put in is the difference between like you know already and i do maybe like a live action film you do like an animated thing where you storyboard it out like know exactly what's going to happen uh hit it like three different times at three different layers um, and the final project is better for well, it. Well, I, I definitely put way more work into it than I did in my papers in high school. So <laughs> I told my English teacher that I went for a walk with him well, probably a couple of years ago now. And I was like, yeah, I'm kind of doing what I used to do for you in high school, but I do a lot more work on it this time. You know, I never did a second draft then unless I had to turn in the first one. So I would say that's something that high school fails on is larger projects and helping people like do drafts and, and, you know, go back and work on stuff because so much of, of high school is like, learn this, regurgitate it, spit it out, move on to the next thing. Cause we've got so much to cover. We can never go back and really refine things very well. 
That was one of the things I loved in college was all the iterative writing processes. Like we would get like docked points if we didn't use the writing lab and the writing tutors like at the library, uh, which was frustrating in one hand, but like just the chance to do your pr- your paper iteratively as part of the learning process was like, I mean, I did that anyway, because I'm ridiculous in high school and middle school, but it was it was really cool that the teachers actually wanted us to do that in college. <laughs> I was always very much forced to like, I never felt like I was given the right amount of time. It was like, yes, do, do your rough draft and then have the final draft two days later. And it's like, I'm just going to do one draft. And often I'd write my final draft and make it look worse. And that would be my rough draft. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I turned in a rough draft that was actually me like adding in errors to my first draft. That's kind of brilliant and diabolical. I appreciate it. <laughs> like it's yeah. I just I I, I well, and I was a particularly bad procrastinator when it came to writing. Like I really, really didn't want to write. I always wrote it the night before, and I usually stayed up really late. Mm-hmm. So they got whatever I pulled mm-hmm. out of my ass the night before, and unfortunately, in a lot of ways, I was usually able to get an A or a B on it because I'm a good bullshit artist. Same and. Yeah. So I was utterly unprepared when I went to college. I didn't know how to study or do any of those processes and didn't particularly care to because I wanted to smoke weed. And so I was fucking hosed when I got to college. I yeah, was not prepared to do anything academically and yeah, wasted my parents' money. So At least it was their money. not yours now i writing was always really easy for me like i don't know my my adhd brain really came in clutch for me Uh. when it comes to writing like i could just i would my strategy was just to word vomit my entire stream of consciousness until i was a couple hundred words over the limit and then just start editing and refining from the top and just go Mm -hmm. back through and be like oh no that's a dumb way to say that no change those words get a reference in here and like it wasn't until the end, like the senioritis kicked in for that last year. And literally, <laughs> for reasons that are too complicated to go into, I I was literally writing and submitting my last paper as Brandon was moving us out of our apartment. Like, literally, I was sitting in the living room as the house or the apartment was getting broken down around us, frantically finishing up my last paper because the senioritis had gotten so bad that I actually was procrastinating up until the last minute, which I historically didn't do. It was wild. And it was like my longest, biggest, most culminative paper like ever. And I was like literally submitting it so that way they could move the desk out from under me. (laughs) So ridiculous. I wish I had that word vomit. That was the, I can do the I can do the editing. I can do the refinement. But the word vomit was something I could never quite come up with. I think now, if I was back in high school, I would have tried voice to text. Mm-hmm. Um, because I can talk all day long, but the second I start typing, I don't know if it's dyslexia. I don't know if it's ADHD. I don't know what it is. But I start obsessing over like I'll type a sentence and be like, Oh no, I got I, that. That sentence doesn't make any sense. Let me rearrange it. I'll I'll spend like three hours like rewriting the first sentence. I broke myself of that in middle school. I had that problem. And I was like, I can, ne- this will not stand. So I trained myself to be able to do stream of consciousness writing. I'm jealous because it, it's a binary. It's like either obsess over making it perfect or absolutely no filter. Like, <laughs> and, and the only place I've discovered that I can do that yeah. is in the podcast, which is where we stream of consciousness, what we're doing here, and then go back in the edit and cut out all the really dumb things you live people just heard us say. <laughs> I try to cut out the dumb things but then i forget that i'm just like not just like so i'll literally just be thinking i'm listening to the podcast and just sort of playing a game and then i realize that the game is me editing <laughs> it's like oh right mm-hmm. i have to take shit mm-hmm. out <laughs> fuck <laughs> that kind of reminds me of when uh, michael kramer talks about how when you're narrating the first thing to go is mm-hmm. your brain mm-hmm. not your voice like he doesn't really have to take care of his voice because his brain goes yeah. first right like yeah no and i don't remember what i say when i'm recording like Mm-mm. Isn't that isn't that hilarious to go back and edit and be like, wow, I don't remember Input saying that. Input and output modes just cannot function at the same mm-hmm. time. Like, nope. It's one of the reasons why I can have like garbage notes and record a rough draft and feel like it was terrible the whole time, and then go back and listen to it and be like, actually, it came out okay. I can do something with this. Mm-hmm. So it's like a forest for the trees kind of scale thing. 
Yeah. These trees are too close together. When I think uh, a podcast recording is garbage, it's often because I'm focusing on one line or one thing I said or one thing that didn't particularly go the way I wanted it to. And oftentimes that's, you know, five minutes out of a two hour recording at most. And it's like, oh, no, there's there's an hour and 55 minutes of quality content in here. You're just focusing on the one thing that you weren't happy with. Well, I uh, I couldn't keep doing the kind of what I was I was releasing like uh, special mini shows that accompanied each episode all through like book four, and I couldn't keep doing it because it was too much extra content. So I was like, well, okay, I could release my rough drafts so people would have access to that. And I really had to think hard to even talk myself into it because there's like so much stream of consciousness shit that I end up cutting out in the final draft shit where I'm like, wow, I really shouldn't say that. Just like all kinds of shit. And I was just kind of like, do I even want to put that out there? And I'm like, eh, it's fine. There's only like a couple of people who will be able to see it. So it doesn't even matter. And yeah, I, it, it felt like a special, like letting someone see an unedited thing is like a special form of like putting yourself out there. And that's, Something that I was like, okay, well, I, I've got to do it because I just literally don't have the time to come up with anything else. And yeah, Seth just trusts me to handle that every time. It's terrible. I, probably. Well, you trusted me for a long time, so <laughs> you're a much more thorough editor than I am. I just take out the garbage. You actually critique the content. I'm just like, oh, this is fine. It's, yeah. Um, well, I figure after 400 episodes, um, I, I think, you know, I've gotten better at not having terrible content. I think in the beginning, the content actually did need much more heavy Sure, editing. yeah, because, I mean, as the adage goes, uh, write drunk, edit sober. <laughs> and yeah, uh, yes, yeah, when you're yes. learning a new skill and then putting out the products of learning said skill. Speaking of making editing a little bit easier, do you want to cut off recording so you don't have to edit this entire garbage conversation? <laughs> yeah, let's, let's, let's cut off recording. That, that'll, that'll do. So I got the Leatherman Bond multi-tool. Okay. So it's a little bit smaller. It's a little bit easier to carry. Pretty lightweight. That was important to me. Yeah, they're super useful. We got like the overwhelming majority of American knife companies are in Oregon. Mm -hmm. Leatherman, Columbia River Knife and Tool, Benchmade, Kershaw, Gerber, a huge majority of them. Because we have very lax laws here. Mm. Lax laws about what? Knife manufacturing or labor laws? Or what kind of laws are we talking about? Uh, knife laws in particular. As far as what you can carry concealed, what you can open carry, um, being able to carry an automatic, like to carry an automatic concealed, you have to have a concealed carry permit. But if you have like a, a pocket clip or whatever, it's legal for a civilian to carry a, a switchblade. So just all that kind of stuff. So there's a market for it. Well, I mean, it's... I guess good for our, we're a weird state, you know, so if we're like super, super <laughs> blue, but also like full of redneckiness and we just have laxer and streaks of yeah. green, just mm -hmm. like aggressive streaks of green that just refuse to be blue or yeah. red, <laughs> sticky, skunky green. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I live in a very, my mom has always described the area I live in as green neck. Green neck. Mm, like, green neck, I like that. That is the blending of cultures that exist uh, in, in rural Western Oregon. But yeah, I can see where, like, other than Portland and a couple of the cities in, in the valley. Um, yep. It's all about that I-5 corridor. That's where yeah, the blues are. That's where the blues are. And then everything west of that is very country and very rural. And there's a lot of, I can see where the knife carrying is really important to a lot of folks out there. But even our biggest city is, like, a jumped up town with trees and unpaved streets all mm -hmm. through it. So like, you know, we're a rural timber hunting kind of vibe, even when we're in our cities. Yeah. The, the reason our soccer team is called the Timbers mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah. Stump town is the name because they cut down all the trees. Um, they grew <laughs> most of them back, but they cut them all down first. One of Eugene's high schools is their, their mascot has been uh, the Axemen. For a couple of decades, it's a terrible name, and they should change it because they've changed it before to Axemen, and that was a bad call, and they should continue to change it until they find something better. But still, it says something. I mean, yeah, I mean, Oregon City yeah. is the pioneers. That's basically they have an axe on their shoulder. That's an Axeman, but like 
more mm-hmm. politics. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe they go with sawman. A sawman. There you go. And then if it, if you're not doing timber stuff, you're doing fishing stuff. Mm-hmm. Which also very knife oriented suite of uh, trades. Yep. Boats, fishing, all that. Speaking of knives, shall we cut these pink ribbons? <laughs> Well, that's, that's, that's a nice it. little segue there. Let's go. <laughs> I'm getting better at them. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was good. That was good. Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?